Section 15 of The South Pole This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Philippa Jevons The South Pole by Roald Amundsen Translation by A. G. Carter Section 15 Volume 1, Chapter 7 Preparing for Winter Winter I believe most people look upon winter as a time of storms, cold, and discomfort. They look forward to it with sadness, and bow before the inevitable. Providence ordains it so. The prospect of a ball or two cheers them up a little, and makes the horizon somewhat brighter, but all the same, darkness and cold, ugh, no, let us have summer, they say. What my comrades thought about the winter that was approaching, I cannot say. For my part, I looked forward to it with pleasure. When I stood out there on the snow hill, and saw the light shining out of the kitchen window, there came over me an indescribable feeling of comfort and well-being. And the blacker and more stormy the winter night might be, the greater would be this feeling of well-being inside our snug little house. I see the reader's questioning look, and know what he will say. But weren't you awfully afraid the barrier would break off and float you out to sea? I will answer this question as frankly as possible. With one exception, we were all at this time of the opinion that the part of the barrier on which the hut stood rested on land, so that any fear of a sea voyage was quite superfluous. As to the one who thought we were afloat, I think I can say very definitely that he was not afraid. I believe, as a matter of fact, that he gradually came round to the same view as the rest of us. If a general is to win a battle, he must be always prepared. If his opponent makes a move, he must see that he is able to make a counter-move. Everything must be planned in advance, and nothing unforeseen. We were in the same position. We had to consider beforehand what the future might bring, and make our arrangements accordingly while there was time. When the sun had left us and the dark period had set in, it would be too late. What first of all claimed our attention and set our collective brain machinery to work was the female sex. There was no peace for us, even on the barrier. What happened was that the entire feminine population, eleven in number, had thought fit to appear in a condition usually considered interesting, but which, under the circumstances, we by no means regarded in that light. Our hands were indeed full enough without this. What was to be done? Great deliberation. Eleven maternity hospitals seemed rather a large order, but we knew by experience that they all required first aid. If we left several of them in the same place, there would be a terrible scene, and it would end in their eating up each other's pups. For what had happened only a few days before, Kaiser, a big black-and-white bitch, had taken a three-months-old pup when no one was looking, and made a meal of it. When we arrived, we saw the tip of its tail disappearing, so there was not much to be done. Now, it fortunately happened that one of the dog tents became vacant, as Prestrude's team was divided among the other tents, as forerunner he had no use for dogs. Here, with a little contrivance, we could get two of them disposed of. A dividing wall could be put up. When first laying out the station, we had taken this side of life into consideration, and a hospital in the shape of a sixteen-man tent had been erected, but this was not nearly enough. We then had recourse to the material of which there is such superabundance in these parts of the earth, snow. We erected a splendid big snow hut. Besides this, Lindstrom in his leisure hours had erected a little building which was ready when we returned from the second depot journey. We had none of us asked what it was for, but now we knew Lindstrom's kind heart. With these arrangements at our disposal, we were able to face the winter. Camilla, the sly old fox, had taken things in time. She knew what it meant to bring up children in the dark, and in truth it was no pleasure. She had therefore made haste, 
and was ready as soon as the original hospital was prepared. She could now look forward to the future with calmness in the last rays of the disappearing sun. When darkness set in, her young ones would be able to look after themselves. Camilla, by the way, had her own views of bringing up her children. What there was about the hospital that she did not like, I do not know, but it is certain that she preferred any other place. It was no rare thing to come across Camilla in a tearing gale and a temperature twenty below zero, with one of her offspring in her mouth. She was going out to look for a new place. Meanwhile, the three others who had to wait were shrieking and howling. The places she chose were not, as a rule, such as we should connect with the idea of comfort. A case, for instance, standing on its side, and fully exposed to the wind, or behind a stack of planks, with a draught coming through that would have done credit to a factory chimney. But, if she liked it, there was nothing to be said. If the family were left alone in such a place, she would spend some days there before moving on again. She never returned to the hospital voluntarily, but it was not a rare thing to see Johansen, who was guardian to the family, hauling off the lady and as many of her little ones as he could get hold of in a hurry. They then disappeared into the hospital with words of encouragement. At the same time we introduced a new order of things with our dogs. Hitherto we had been obliged to keep them tied up, on account of seal hunting, otherwise they went off by themselves and ravaged. There were certain individuals who specially distinguished themselves in this way, like Visting's Major. He was a born hunter, afraid of nothing. Then there was Hassel's Svartan, but a good point about him was that he went off alone, while the Major always had a whole staff with him. They usually came back with their faces all covered with blood. To put a stop to this sport we had been obliged to keep them fast, but now that the seals had left us we could let them loose. Naturally the first use to which they put their liberty was fighting. In the course of time, for reasons impossible to discover, bitter feelings and hatred had arisen between certain of the dogs, and now they were offered an opportunity of deciding which was the stronger, and they seized upon it with avidity. But after a time their manners improved, and a regular fight became a rarity. There were, of course, a few who could never see each other without flying at one another's throats, like Lassesen and Hans, for instance, but we knew their ways and could keep an eye on them. The dogs soon knew their respective tents and their places in them. They were let loose as soon as we came out in the morning, and were chained up again in the evening when they were to be fed. They got so used to this that we never had much trouble. They all reported themselves cheerfully when we came in the evening to fasten them up, and every animal knew his own master and tent, and knew at once what was expected of him. With howls of delight the various dogs collected about their masters, and made for the tents in great jubilation. We kept up this arrangement the whole time. Their food consisted of seal's flesh and blubber one day, and dried fish the next. As a rule both disappeared without any objection, though they certainly preferred the seal. Throughout the greater part of the winter we had carcasses of seals lying on the slope, and these were usually a centre of great interest. The spot might be regarded as the market-place of Framheim, and it was not always a peaceful one. The customers were many, and the demand great, so that sometimes lively scenes took place. Our own store of seal's flesh was in the meat tent. About a hundred seals had been cut up and stacked there. As already mentioned, we built a wall of snow two yards high round this tent, as a protection against the dogs. Although they had as much to eat as they wanted, and although they knew they were not allowed to try to get in, or possibly this prohibition was just the incentive, they were always casting longing eyes in that direction, and the number of claw marks in the wall spoke eloquently of what went on when we were not looking. Snipperson, in particular, could not keep herself away from that wall, and she was extremely light and agile so that she had the best chance. She never engaged in this sport by herself, but always enticed out her attendant cavaliers, Fix and Lasse. These, however, were less active, and had to be content with looking on. While she jumped inside the wall, which she only succeeded in doing once or twice, they ran round yelling. As soon as we heard their howls we knew exactly what was happening, 
and one of us went out, armed with a stick. It required some cunning to catch her in the act, for as soon as one approached, her cavaliers stopped howling, and she understood that something was wrong. Her red fox's head could then be seen over the top, looking round. It need scarcely be said that she did not jump into the arms of the man with the stick, but as a rule he did not give up until he had caught and punished her. Fix and Lasser also had their turns. It was true they had done nothing wrong, but they might. They knew this, and watched Snipperson's chastisement at a distance. The tent where we kept the dried fish stood always open. None of them attempted to take fish. The sun continued its daily course lower and lower. We did not see much of it after the return from the last depot journey. On April the 11th it came and vanished again at once. Easter came round on the barrier as in other parts of the globe, and had to be kept. Holidays with us were marked by eating a little more than usual. There was no other sign. We did not dress differently, nor did we introduce any other change. In the evening of a holiday we generally had a little gramophone, a glass of toddy and a cigar, but we were careful with the gramophone. We knew we should soon get tired of it if we used it too often, therefore we only brought it out on rare occasions, but we enjoyed its music all the more when we heard it. When Easter was over a sigh of relief escaped us all. These holidays are always tiring. They are tedious enough in places which have more amusements to offer than the barrier, but here they were insufferably long. Our manner of life was now completely in order, and everything worked easily and well. The chief work of the winter would be the perfecting of our outfit for the coming sledge journey to the south. Our object was to reach the pole. Everything else was secondary. The meteorological observations were in full swing and arranged for the winter. Observations were made at 8 a.m., 2 p.m. and 8 p.m. We were so short-handed that I could not spare anyone for night duty, besides which, living as we did in a small space, it would have a disturbing effect if there were always someone moving about. There would never be any peace. My special aim was that everyone should be happy and comfortable, so that when the spring came we might all be fresh and well and eager to take up the final task. It was not my intention that we should spend the winter in idleness, far from it. To be contented and well, a man must always be occupied. I therefore expected everyone to be busy during the hours that were set apart for work. At the end of the day each man was free to do what he pleased. We had also to keep some sort of order and tidiness, as well as circumstances permitted. It was therefore decided that each of us should take a week's duty as orderly. This duty consisted in sweeping the floor every morning, emptying ashtrays, etc. To secure plenty of ventilation, especially in our sleeping places, a rule was made that no one might have anything under his bunk except the boots he had in wear. Each man had two pegs to hang his clothes on, and this was sufficient for what he was wearing every day. All superfluous clothing was stuffed into our kit bags and put out. In this way we succeeded in maintaining some sort of tidiness. In any case, the worst of the dirt was got rid of. Whether a fastidious housekeeper would have found everything in order is doubtful. Everyone had his regular work. Prestrud, with the assistant of Johansen, looked after the astronomical observations and pendulum observations. Hassel was set in authority over coal, wood and paraffin. He was responsible for the supply lasting out. As manager of the Framheim coal and wood business, he of course received the title of director, and this dignity might possibly have gone to his head if the occupation of errand boy had not been combined with it. But it was. Besides receiving the orders, he had to deliver the goods, and he discharged his duties with distinction. He succeeded in hoodwinking his largest customer, Lindstrom, to such an extent that in the course of the winter he saved a good deal of coal. Hansen had to keep the depot in order and bring in everything we required. Visting had charge of the whole outfit, and was responsible that nothing was touched without permission. Bjarland and Stuberud were to look after the penthouse and the passage round the hut. Lindstrom was occupied in the kitchen, the hardest and most thankless work on an expedition like this. No one says anything so long as the food is good, 
but let the cook be unlucky and burn the soup one day, and he will hear something. Lindstrom had the excellent disposition of a man who is never put out. Whatever people might say, it was all the same to him. On April the 19th we saw the sun for the last time, since it then went below our horizon, the ridge to the north. It was intensely red and surrounded by a sea of flame, which did not disappear altogether until the 21st. Now everything was well. As far as the hut was concerned, it could not be better, but the penthouse, which it was originally intended to use as a workroom, soon proved too small, dark and cold, besides which all the traffic went through that room, so that work would be constantly interrupted or stopped altogether at times. Except this dark hole, we had no workroom, and we had a lot of work to do. Of course we might use our living room, but then we should be in each other's way all day long, nor would it be a good plan to give up the only room where we could sometimes find peace and comfort to be a workshop. I know it is the usual custom to do so, but I have always found it a bad arrangement. Now, indeed, we were at our wit's end, but circumstances once more came to our aid. For, we may just as well confess it, we had forgotten to bring out a tool which is a commonplace necessity on a polar expedition, namely a snow-shovel. A well-equipped expedition, as ours was to a certain extent, ought to have at least twelve strong, thick iron spades. We had none. We had two remnants, but they did not help us very far. Fortunately, however, we had a very good solid iron plate with us, and now Bjarland stepped into the breach and made a whole dozen of the very best spades. Stuberud managed the handles, and they might all have been turned out by a big factory. This circumstance had very important results for our future well-being, as will be seen. If we had had the shovels with us from the start, we should have cleared the snow away from our door every morning like tidy people. But as we had none, the snow had increased daily before our door, and before Bjarland was ready with the spades, had formed a drift extending from the entrance along the western side of the house. This snowdrift, which was as big as the house itself, naturally caused some frowns when one morning all hands turned out, armed with the new shovels, to make a clearance. As we stood there, afraid to begin, one of us, it must have been Lindstrom, or Hansen, perhaps, or was it myself, well, it doesn't matter, one of us had the bright idea of taking nature in hand and working with her instead of against her. The proposal was that we should dig out a carpenter's shop in the big snowdrift, and put it in direct communication with the hut. This was no sooner suggested than adopted unanimously, and now began a work of tunnelling, which lasted a good while, for one excavation led to another, and we did not stop until we had a whole underground village, probably one of the most interesting works ever executed round a polar station. Let us begin with the morning when we thrust the first spade into the drift. It was Thursday, April the 20th. While three men went to work to dig right into the drift from the hut door westward, three more were busy connecting it with the hut. This was done by stretching boards, the same that we had used on the Fram as a false deck for the dogs, from the drift up to the roof of the penthouse. The open part between the drift and the penthouse on the northern side was filled up entirely into a solid wall, which went up to join the roof that had just been put on. The space between the penthouse and the drift on the south wall was left open as an exit. But now we had the building fever on us, and one ambitious project succeeded another. Thus we agreed to dig a passage the whole length of the drift, and terminate it by a large snow hut in which we were to have a vapour bath. That was something like a plan, a vapour bath in 79 degrees south. Hansen, snow hut builder by profession, went to work at it. He built it quite small and solid, and extended it downward so that when at last it was finished, it measured twelve feet from floor to roof. Here we should have plenty of room to fit up a vapour bath. Meanwhile the tunnellers were advancing. We could hear the sound of their pickaxes and spades coming nearer and nearer. This was too much for Hansen. 
As he had now finished the hut, he set to work to dig his way to the others, and when he begins a thing it does not take him very long. We could hear the two parties continually nearing each other. The excitement increases. Will they meet? Or are they digging side by side on different lines? The Samplon, Montseny, and other engineering works flash through my brain. If they were going to hit it off, we must be— Hello. I was interrupted in my studies by a glistening face which was thrust through the wall just as I was going to dig my spade into it. It was Visting, pioneer of the Framheim Tunnel. He had good reason to be glad he escaped with his nose safe and sound. In another instant I should have had it on my spade. It was a fine sight, this long white passage, ending in the high shining dome. As we dug forward, we dug down at the same time, so as not to weaken the roof. There was plenty to take down below. The barrier was deep enough. When this was finished, we began to work on the carpenter's shop. This had to be dug considerably deeper, as the drift was rounded off a little to the side. We therefore dug first into the drift, and then right down. As far as I remember, we went six feet down into the barrier here. The shop was made roomy, with space enough for both carpenters and length enough for our sledges. The planing bench was cut out in the wall and covered with boards. The workshop terminated at its western end in a little room where the carpenters kept their smaller tools. A broad stairway cut in the snow and covered with boards led from the shop into the passage. As soon as the workshop was finished, the workmen moved in and established themselves under the name of the Carpenters' Union. Here, the whole sledging outfit for the polar journey was remodelled. Opposite the carpenters came the smithy, dug to the same depth as the other. This was less used. On the other side of the smithy, nearer to the hut, a deep hole was dug to receive all the waste water from the kitchen. Between the carpenters' union and the entrance to the penthouse, opposite the ascent to the barrier, we built a little room which, properly speaking, deserves a very detailed explanation but for want of space this must be deferred till later. The ascent to the barrier, which had been left open while all these works were in progress, was now closed by a contrivance which is also worth mentioning. There are a great many people who apparently have never learnt to shut a door after them. Where two or three are gathered together, you generally find at least one who suffers from this defect. How many would there be among us who numbered nine? It is no use asking a victim of this complaint to shut the door after him. He is simply incapable of doing it. I was not yet well enough acquainted with my companions as regards the door-shutting question, and in order to be on the safe side we might just as well put up a self-closing door. This was done by Stubberud, by fixing the door-frame into the wall in an oblique position, just like a cellar door at home. Now the door could not stay open. It had to fall too. I was glad when I saw it finished. We were secured against an invasion of dogs. Four snow steps covered with boards led from the door down into the passage. In addition to all these new rooms, we had thus gained an extra protection for our house. While this work was in progress, our instrument maker had his hands full. The clockwork mechanism of the thermograph had gone wrong. The spindle was broken, I believe. This was particularly annoying because this thermograph had been working so well in low temperatures. The other thermograph had evidently been constructed with a view to the tropics. At any rate, it would not go in the cold. Our instrument maker has one method of dealing with all instruments, almost without exception. He puts them in the oven and stokes up the fire. This time it worked remarkably well, since it enabled him to ascertain beyond a doubt that the thing was useless. The thermograph would not work in the cold. Meanwhile, he got it cleared of all the old oil that stuck to it everywhere on wheels and pins like fish glue. Then it was hung up to the kitchen ceiling. The temperature there may possibly revive it and make it think it is in the tropics. In this way, we shall have the temperature of the galley registered, and later on we shall probably be able to reckon up what we have had for dinner in the course of the week. Whether Professor Mohn will be overjoyed with this result is another question, which the instrument-maker and director did not care to go into. Besides these instruments, we have a hygrograph, 
we are well supplied. But this takes one of us out of doors once in the twenty-four hours. Lindstrom has cleaned it and oiled it and set it going. In spite of this, at three in the morning, it comes to a stop. But I have never seen Lindstrom beaten yet. After many consultations, he was given the task of trying to construct a thermograph out of the hygrograph and the disabled thermograph. This was just the job for him. The production he showed me a few hours later made my hair stand on end. What would Steen say? Do you know what it was? Well, it was an old meat tin circulating inside the thermograph case. Heavens, what an insult to the self-registering meteorological instruments. I was thunderstruck, thinking, of course, that the man was making a fool of me. I had carefully studied his face all the time to find the key to this riddle. I did not know whether to laugh or weep. Lindstrom's face was certainly serious enough. If it afforded a measure of the situation, I believe tears would have been appropriate. But when my eye fell upon the thermograph and read, Stavanger Preserving Company's Finest Rissoles, I could contain myself no longer. The comical side of it was too much for me, and I burst into a fit of laughter. When my laughter was subdued, I heard the explanation. The cylinder did not fit, so he had tried the tin, and it went splendidly. The Rissole thermograph worked very well as far as minus 40 degrees C, but then it gave up. Our forces were now divided into two working parties. One of them was to dig out some forty seals we had lying about three feet under the snow. This took two days. The heavy seals' carcasses, hard as flint, were difficult to deal with. The dogs were greatly interested in these proceedings. Each carcass on being raised to the surface was carefully inspected. They were piled up in two heaps, and would provide food enough for the dogs for the whole winter. Meanwhile, the other party were at work, under Hassel's direction, on a petroleum cellar. The barrels, which had been laid up at the beginning of February, were now deep below the snow. They now dug down at both ends of the store, and made a passage below the surface along the barrels. At the same time they dug far enough into the barrier to give the requisite height for the barrels. When the snow had been thrown out, one hole was walled up again, while a large entrance was constructed over the other. Stuberud's knowledge of vaulting came in useful here, and he has the credit of having built the splendid arched entrance to the oil store. It was a pleasure to go down into it. Probably no one has had so fine a storehouse for petroleum before. But Hassel did not stop here. He had the building fever on him in earnest. His great project of connecting the coal and wood store with the house below the surface nearly took my breath away. It seemed to me an almost superhuman labour, but they did it. The distance from the coal tent to the house was about ten yards. Here Hassel and Stiberud laid out their line so that it would strike the passage round the house at the southeast angle. When they had done this, they dug a gigantic hole down into the barrier halfway between the tent and the house, and then dug in both directions from here, and soon finished the work. But now Prestrud had an idea. While the hole remained open, he wished to avail himself of the opportunity of arranging an observatory for his pendulum apparatus, and he made a very good one. He did it by digging at right angles to the passage, and had his little observatory between the coal tent and the house. When all the snow was cleared out, the big hole was covered over again, and now we could go from the kitchen direct to the coal store without going out. First we followed the passage round the house, you remember where all the tinned provisions stood in such perfect order. Then, on reaching the southeast angle of the house, this new passage opened out and led across to the coal tent. In the middle of the passage, on the right-hand side, a door led into the pendulum observatory. Continuing along the passage, one came first to some steps leading down, and then the passage ended in a steep flight of steps which led up through a hole in the snow surface. On going up this, one suddenly found oneself in the middle of the coal tent. It was a fine piece of work, and did all honour to its designers. It paid, too. Hassel could now fetch coal at any time under cover, and escaped having to go out of doors. But this was not the end of our great underground works. We wanted a room where Visting could store all the things in his charge, 
He was specially anxious about the reindeer-skin clothing, and wished to have it under a roof. We therefore decided upon a room sufficiently large to house all these articles, and at the same time to provide working space for Visting and Hansen, who would have to lash all the sledges as fast as they came from Bjarland. Visting elected to build this room in a big snowdrift that had formed around the tent in which he had kept all his stuff. The spot lay to the northeast of the house. The clothing store, as this building was called, was fairly large, and provided space not only for all our equipment, but also for a workshop. From it a door led into a very small room, where Visting set up his sewing machine, and worked on it all through the winter. Continuing in a north-easterly direction, we came to another big room, called the Crystal Palace, in which all the ski and sledging cases were stored. Here all the provisions for the sledge journey were packed. For the time being this room remained separate from the others, and we had to go out of doors to reach it. Later, when Lindstrom had dug out an enormous hole in the barrier, at the spot where he took all the snow and ice for cooking, we connected this with the two rooms last mentioned, and were thus finally able to go everywhere under the snow. The astronomical observatory had also arisen. It lay right alongside the Crystal Palace. But it had an air of suffering from debility, and before very long it passed peacefully away. Prestrud afterwards invented many patents. He used an empty barrel for a time as a pedestal, then an old block of wood. His experience of instrument stands is manifold. All these undertakings were finished at the beginning of May. One last piece of work remained, and then at last we should be ready. This was the rebuilding of the depot. The small heaps in which the cases were piled proved unsatisfactory, as the passages between the different piles offered a fine sight for snowdrifts. All the cases were now taken out and laid in two long rows, with sufficient intervals between them to prevent their offering resistance to the drifting snow. This work was carried out in two days. The days were now fairly short, and we were ready to take up our indoor work. The winter duties were assigned as follows. Prestrud, scientific observations. Johansen, packing of sledging provisions. Hassel had to keep Lindstrom supplied with coal, wood and paraffin, and to make whiplashes, an occupation he was very familiar with from the Fram's second expedition. Stubberud was to reduce the weight of the sledge cases to a minimum, besides doing a lot of other things. There was nothing he could not turn his hand to, so the programme of his winter work was left rather vague. I knew he would manage a great deal more than the sledge cases, though it must be said that it was a tiresome job he had. Bjarland was allotted the task which we all regarded with intense interest, the alteration of the sledges. We knew that an enormous amount of weight could be saved, but how much? Hansen and Visting had to lash together the different parts as they were finished. This was to be done in the clothing store. These two had also a number of other things on their programme for the winter. There are many who think that a polar expedition is synonymous with idleness. I wish I had had a few adherents of this belief at Framheim that winter. They would have gone away with a different opinion. Not that the hours of work were excessively long. The circumstances forbade that. But during those hours the work was brisk. On several previous sledge journeys, I have made the experience that thermometers are very fragile things. It often happens that at the beginning of a journey one breaks all one's thermometers, and is left without any means of determining the temperature. If, in such circumstances, one had accustomed oneself to guess the temperature, it would have given the mean temperature for the month with a fair degree of accuracy. The guesses for single days might vary somewhat from reality on one side or the other, but, as I say, one would arrive at a fair estimate of the mean temperature. With this in mind, I started a guessing competition. As each man came in in the morning, he gave his opinion of the temperature of the day, and this was entered in a book. At the end of the month the figures were gone through, and the one who had guessed correctly the greatest number of times won the prize, a few cigars. Besides giving practice in guessing the temperature, it was a very good diversion to begin the day with. When one day is almost exactly like another, as it was with us, the first hour of the morning is often apt to be a little sour, especially before one has had one's cup of coffee. 
I may say at once that this morning grumpiness very seldom showed itself with us, but one never knows, one cannot always be sure. The most amiable man may often give one a surprise before the coffee has had its effect. In this respect the guessing was an excellent thing. It took up everyone's attention and diverted the critical moments. Each man's entrance was awaited with excitement, and one man was not allowed to make his guess in the hearing of the next. That would undoubtedly have exercised an influence. Therefore they had to speak as they came in, one by one. Now, Stubberud, what's the temperature today? Stubberud had his own way of calculating, which I never succeeded in getting at. One day, for instance, he looked about him and studied the various faces. It isn't warm today, he said at last, with a great deal of conviction. I could immediately console him with the assurance that he had guessed right. It was minus 69 degrees Fahrenheit. The monthly results were very interesting. So far as I remember, the best performance the competition could show in any month was eight approximately correct guesses. A man might keep remarkably close to the actual temperature for a long time, and then suddenly one day make an error of 25 degrees. It proved that the winner's mean temperature agreed within a few tenths of a degree with the actual mean temperature of the month, and if one took the mean of all the competitors' mean temperatures, it gave a result which, practically speaking, agreed with the reality. It was especially with this object in view that this guessing was instituted. If later on we should be so unlucky as to lose all our thermometers, we should not be entirely at a loss. It may be convenient to mention here that on the southern sledge journey we had four thermometers with us. Observations were taken three times daily, and all four were brought home in undamaged condition. Listing had charge of this scientific branch, and I think the feat he achieved in not breaking any thermometers is unparalleled. End of section 15. Volume 1, Chapter 7. Preparing for Winter. Section 16 of the South Pole. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Philippa Jevons. The South Pole by Roald Amundsen. Translation by A. G. Carter. Section 16. Volume 1. Chapter 8. A Day at Framheim. Part 1. In order to understand our daily life better, we will now make a tour of Framheim. It is June the 23rd, early in the morning. Perfect stillness lies over the barrier, such stillness as no one who has not been in these regions has any idea of. We come up the old sledge road from the place where the Fram used to lie. You will stop several times on the way and ask whether this can be real. Anything so inconceivably beautiful has never yet been seen. There lies the northern edge of the Fram barrier, with Mounts Nelson and Ronneken nearest. Behind them, ridge after ridge, peak after peak, the venerable pressure masses rise, one higher than another. The light is so wonderful. What causes this strange glow? It is as clear as daylight, and yet the shortest day of the year is at hand. There are no shadows, so it cannot be the moon. No. It is one of the few really intense appearances of the aurora australis that receives us now. It looks as though nature wished to honour our guests and to show herself in her best attire. And it is a gorgeous dress she has chosen. Perfectly calm, clear with a starry sparkle and not a sound in any direction. But wait, what is that? Like a stream of fire the light shoots across the sky and a whistling sound follows the movement. Hush! Can't you hear? It shoots forward again, takes the form of a band, and glows in rays of red and green. It stands still for a moment, thinking of what direction it shall take, and then away again, followed by an intermittent whistling sound. So nature has offered us, on this wonderful morning, one of her most mysterious, most incomprehensible phenomena, the audible southern light. Now you will be able to go home and tell your friends that you have personally seen and heard the southern lights, for I suppose you have no doubt that you have really done so. Doubt? 
How can one be in doubt about what one has heard with one's own ears and seen with one's own eyes? And yet you have been deceived like so many others. The whistling northern and southern lights have never existed. They are only a creation of your own yearning for the mystical, accompanied by your own breath which freezes in the cold air. Goodbye, beautiful dream. It vanishes from the glorious landscape. Perhaps it was stupid of me to call attention to that. My guests have now lost much of the beautiful mystery, and the landscape no longer has the same attraction. Meanwhile we have come up past Nelson and Ronniken, and are just climbing the first ridge. Not far away a big tent rises before us, and in front of it we see two long dark lines. It is our main depot that we are coming to, and you can see that we keep our things in good order, case upon case, as if they had been placed in position by an expert builder. And they all point the same way, all the numbers face the north. "'What made you choose that particular direction?' is the natural question. "'Had you any special object?' "'Oh, yes, we had. If you will look towards the east, you will notice that on the horizon the sky has a rather lighter, brighter colour there than in any other part.' That is the day as we see it now. At present we cannot see to do anything by its light. It would have been impossible to see that these cases were lying with their numbers to the north if it had not been for the brilliant aurora australis. But that light colour will rise and grow stronger. At nine o'clock it will be in the northeast, and we shall be able to trace it ten degrees above the horizon. You would not then think it gave so much light as it really does, but you would be able without an effort to read the numbers. What is more, you would be able to read the maker's names which are marked on several of the cases, and when the flush of daylight has moved to the north, you will be able to see them even more clearly. No doubt these figures and letters are big, about two inches high and fourteen inches broad, but it shows, nevertheless, that we have daylight here at the darkest time of the year, so there is not the absolute darkness that people think. The tent that stands behind there contains dried fish, we have a great deal of that commodity, and our dogs can never suffer hunger. But now we must hurry on if we are to see how the day begins at Framheim. What we're passing now is the mark flag. We have five of them standing between the camp and the depot. They're useful on dark days when the east wind is blowing and the snow falling. And there, on the slope of the hill, you see Framheim. At present it looks like a dark shadow on the snow, although it's not far away. The sharp peaks, you see, pointing to the sky, are all our dog tents. The hut itself you cannot see. It is completely snowed under and hidden in the barrier. But I see you are getting warm with walking. We will go a little more slowly, so that you won't perspire too much. It is not more than minus fifty-one degrees, so you have every reason to be warm walking. With that temperature and calm weather like today, one soon feels warm if one moves about a little. The flat place we have now come down into is a sort of basin. If you bend down and look round the horizon, you will be able with an effort to follow the ridges and hummocks the whole way round. Our house lies on the slope we are now approaching. We chose that particular spot as we thought it was offered the best protection, and it turned out that we were right. The wind we have had has nearly always come from the east when there was any strength in it, and against such winds the slope provides an excellent shelter. If we had placed our house over there where the depot stands, we should have felt the weather much more severely. But now you must be careful when we come near to the house so that the dogs don't hear us. We have now about a hundred and twenty of them, and if they want to start making a noise, then good-bye to the peaceful polar morning. Now we are there, and in such daylight as there is, you can see the immediate surroundings. You can't see the house, you say. No, I can quite believe that. That chimney sticking out of the snow is all there is left above the barrier. This trap door we are coming to you might take for a loose piece of boarding thrown out on the snow, but that is not the case. It is the way down into our home. You must stoop a bit when you go down into the barrier. Everything is on a reduced scale here in the polar regions. We can't afford to be extravagant. Now you have four steps down. Take care, they're rather high. Luckily we have come in time to see the day started. I see the passage lamp is not yet lighted, so Lindstrom has not turned out. Take hold of the tail of my anorak and follow me. This is a passage in the snow that we are in, leading to the penthouse. Oh, I am so sorry. You must forgive me. Did you hurt yourself? I quite forgot to tell you to look out for the threshold of the penthouse door. It's not the first time someone's fallen over it. 
That's a trap we've all fallen into, but now we know it and it doesn't catch us any more. If you will wait a second, I'll strike a match and then we shall see our way. Here we are in the kitchen. Now, make yourself invisible and follow me all day, and you will see what our life is like. As you know, it is St. John's Eve, so we shall only work during the forenoon, and you will be able to see how we spend a holiday evening. When you send your account home, you must promise me not to paint it in too strong colours. Goodbye for the present. Brrrr. There's the alarm clock. I wait and wait and wait. At home, I am always accustomed to hear that noise, followed by the passage of a pair of bare feet across the floor and a yawn or so. Here... Not a sound. When Amundsen left me, he forgot to say where I could best put myself. I tried to follow him into the room, but the atmosphere there, no thanks. I could easily guess that nine men were sleeping in a room nineteen feet by thirteen feet. It did not require anyone to tell me that. Still not a sound. I suppose they only keep that alarm clock to make themselves imagine they're turning out. Wait a minute, though. Lintrom! Lintrom! He went by the name of Lindstrom, not Lindstrom. Now, by Jove, you've got to get up. The clock's made row enough. That's Visting. I know his voice. I know him at home. He was always an early bird. A frightful crash. That's Lindstrom slipping out of his bunk. But if he was late in turning out, it did not take him long to get into his clothes. One, two, three, and there he stood in the doorway with a little lamp in his hand. It was now six o'clock. He looked well, round and fat as when I saw him last. He is in dark blue clothes with a knitted helmet over his head. I should like to know why. It's certainly not cold in here. For that matter, I've often felt it colder in kitchens at home in the winter, so that cannot be the reason. Ah, oh, I have it. He is bald and doesn't like to show it. That is often the way with bald men. They hate anyone seeing it. The first thing he does is to lay the fire. The range is under the window. It takes up half the six feet by thirteen feet of the kitchen. His method of laying a fire is the first thing that attracts my attention. At home we generally begin by splitting sticks and laying the wood in very carefully. But Lindstrom just shoves the wood in anyhow all over the place. Well, if he can make that burn, he's clever. I'm still wondering how he'll manage it when he suddenly stoops down and picks up a can. Without the slightest hesitation, as though it were the most natural thing in the world... He pours paraffin over the wood. Not one or two drops, oh no, he throws on enough to make sure. A match. And then I understood how Lindstrom got it to light. It was smartly done, I must say. But Hassel ought to have seen it. Amundsen had told me something of their arrangements on the way up, and I knew Hassel was responsible for coal, wood and oil. The water pot had been filled the evening before, and he had only to push it to one side to make room for the kettle. This did not take long to boil, with the heat he had set going. The fire burned up so that it roared in the chimney. This fellow is not short of fuel. Strange what a hurry he is in to get that coffee ready. I thought breakfast was at eight, and it's not now more than a quarter past six. He grinds the coffee till his cheeks shake to and fro incessantly. If the quality is in proportion to the quantity, it must be good enough. Devil take it, Lindstrom's morning greeting. This coffee mill is not worth throwing to the pigs. Might just as well chew the beans. It wouldn't take so long. And he is right. After a quarter of an hour's hard work, he has only ground just enough. Now it is half past six. On with the coffee. Ah, oh, what a perfume. I would give something to know where Amundsen got it from. Meanwhile, the cook has taken out his pipe and is smoking away gaily on an empty stomach. It does not seem to do him any harm. Hello, there's the coffee boiling over. While the coffee was boiling and Lindstrom smoked, I was still wondering why he was in such a hurry to get the coffee ready. You ass, I thought, can't you see? Of course, he's going to give himself a drink of fresh hot coffee before the others are up. That's clear enough. When the coffee was ready, I sat down on a camp stool that stood in a corner and watched him. But I must say he surprised me again. He pushed the coffee kettle away from the fire and took down a cup from the wall, then went to a jug that stood on the bench and poured out, would you believe it, a cup of cold tea. If he goes on in this way, we shall have surprises enough before evening, I thought to myself. 
Then he began to be deeply interested in an enamelled iron bowl which stood on a shelf above the range. The heat, which was now intense, I looked at the thermograph which hung from the ceiling, it registered 84 degrees Fahrenheit, did not seem to be sufficient for its mysterious contents. It was also wrapped up in towels and cloths, and gave me the impression of having caught a severe cold. The glances he threw into it from time to time were anxious. He looked at the clock, and seemed to have something on his mind. Then suddenly I saw his face brighten. He gave a long, not very melodious whistle, bent down, seized a dustpan, and hurried out into the penthouse. Now I was really excited what was coming next. He came back at once with a happy smile all over his face, and the dustpan full of coal. If I had been curious before, I was now anxious. I withdrew as far as possible from the range, sat down on the floor itself, and fixed my eyes on the thermograph. As I thought, the pen began to move upward with rapid steps. This was too bad. I made up my mind to pay a visit to the Meteorological Institute as soon as I got home, and tell them what I had seen with my own eyes. But now the heat seemed intolerable down on the floor where I was sitting. What must it be like? Heavens above, the man was sitting on the stove. He must have gone out of his mind. I was just going to give a cry of terror, when the door opened and in came Amundsen from the room. I gave a deep sigh. Now it would be all right. The time was ten minutes past seven. Morning, Fatty. Morning. What's it like outside? Easterly breeze and thick when I was out, but that's a good while ago. This fairly took my breath away. He stood there with the coolest air in the world and talked about the weather, and I could take my oath he had not been outside the door that morning. "'How's it getting on today? Is it coming?' Amundsen looks with interest at the mysterious bowl. Lindstrom takes another peep under the cloth. "'Yes, it's coming at last, but I've had to give it a lot today.' "'Yes, it feels like it,' answers the other, and goes out. My interest is now divided between it in the bowl and Amundsen's return, with the meteorological discussion that will ensue. It is not long before he reappears, Evidently the temperature outside is not inviting. "'Let's hear again, my friend,' he seats himself on the camp-stool, beside which I am sitting on the floor. "'What kind of weather did you say it was?' I prick up my ears. There is going to be fun. "'It was an easterly breeze and thick as a wall when I was out at six o'clock.' "'Hm. Then it has cleared remarkably quickly. It's a dead calm now, and quite clear. "'Ah, uh, that's just what I should have thought.' I could see it was falling light, and it was getting brighter in the east. He got out of that well. Meanwhile, it was again the turn of the bowl. It was taken down from the shelf over the range and put on the bench. The various cloths were removed one by one until it was left perfectly bare. I could not resist any longer. I had to get up and look. And indeed it was worth looking at. The bowl was filled to the brim with golden yellow dough, full of air bubbles, and showing every sign that he had got it to rise. Now I began to respect Lindstrom. He was a devil of a fellow. No confectioner in our native latitudes could have shown a finer dough. It was now 7.25. Everything seems to go by the clock here. Lindstrom threw a last tender glance at his bowl, picked up a little bottle of spirit, and went into the next room. I saw my chance of following him in, there was not going to be any fun out there with Amundsen, who was sitting on the camp-stool half asleep. In the other room it was pitch dark, and an atmosphere, no, ten atmospheres at least. I stood in the doorway and breathed heavily. Lindstrom stumbled forward in the darkness, felt for and found the matches. He struck one, and lighted a spirit-holder that hung beneath a hanging lamp. There was not much to be seen by the light of the spirit-flame, one could still only guess. Here, too, perhaps. They were sound sleepers, those boys. One grunted here, and another there. They were snoring in every corner. The spirit might have been burning for a couple of minutes, when Lindstrom had set to work in a hurry. He was off just as the flame went out, leaving the room in black darkness. I heard the spirit bottle and the nearest stool upset, and what followed, I don't know, as I was unfamiliar with the surroundings, but there was a good deal of it. I heard a click, 
I had no idea what it was, and then the same movement back again to the lamp. Of course, he now fell over the stool he had upset before. Meanwhile, there was a hissing sound and a stifling smell of paraffin. I was thinking of making my escape through the door when, suddenly, just as I suppose it happened on the first day of creation, in an instant there was light. But it was a light that defies description. It dazzled and hurt the eyes it was so bright. It was perfectly white and extremely agreeable when one was not looking at it. Evidently it was one of the two hundred candle lux lamps. My admiration for Lindstrom had now risen to enthusiasm. What would I not have given to be able to make myself visible, embrace him and tell him what I thought of him? But that could not be. I should not then be able to see life at Framheim as it really was. So I stood still. Lindstrom first tried to put straight what he had upset in his struggle with the lamp. The spirit had, of course, run out of the bottle when it fell and was now flowing all over the table. This did not seem to make the slightest impression on him. A little scoop with his hand, and it all landed on Johansen's clothes, which were lying close by. This fellow seemed to be as well off for spirit as for paraffin. Then he vanished into the kitchen, but reappeared immediately with plates, cups, knives and forks. Lindstrom's laying of the breakfast table was the finest clattering performance I have ever heard. If he wanted to put a spoon into a cup, he did not do it in the ordinary way. No, he put down the cup, lifted the spoon high in the air, and then dropped it into the cup. The noise he made in this way was infernal. Now I began to see why Amundsen got up so early. He wanted to escape this process of laying the table, I expect. But this gave me at once an insight into the good humour of the gentleman in bed. If this had happened anywhere else, Lindstrom would have had a boot at his head. But here... They must have been the most peaceable men in the world. Meanwhile, I had time to look around me. Close to the door where I was standing, a pipe came down to the floor. It struck me at once that this was a ventilating pipe. I bent down and put my hand over the opening. There was not so much as a hint of air to be felt. So this was the cause of the bad atmosphere. The next things that caught my eye were the bunks, nine of them, three on the right-hand side and six on the left. Most of the sleepers, if they could be regarded as such while the table was being laid, slept in bags, sleeping bags. They must have been warm enough. The rest of the space was taken up by a long table with small stools on two sides of it. Order appeared to reign. Most of the clothes were hung up. Of course, a few lay on the floor, but then Lindstrom had been running about in the dark and perhaps he had pulled them down. On the table by the window stood a gramophone and some tobacco boxes and ashtrays. The furniture was not plentiful, nor was it in the style of Louis Quinze or Louis Seize, but it was sufficient. On the wall with the window hung a few paintings, and on the other portraits of the King, Queen and Crown Prince Olaf, apparently cut out of an illustrated paper and pasted on blue cardboard. In the corner nearest the door on the right, where there was no bunk, the space seemed to be occupied by clothes, some hanging on the wall, some on lines stretched across. So that was the drying place, modest in its simplicity. Under the table were some varnished boxes. Heaven knows what they were for. Now there seemed to be life in one of the bunks. It was Visting, who was getting tired of the noise that still continued. Lindstrom took his time, rattling the spoons, smiling maliciously to himself, and looking up at the bunks. He did not make all this racket for nothing. Fisting, then, was the first to respond, and apparently the only one. At any rate, there was not a sign of movement in any of the others. "'Good morning, Fatty. Thought you were going to stop there till dinner.' This is Lindstrom's greeting. "'Look after yourself, Olden. If I hadn't got you out, you'd have been asleep still.' That was paying him in his own coin. Fisting was evidently not to be trifled with. However, they smiled and nodded to each other in a way that showed there was no harm meant. At last, Lindstrom had got rid of the last cup, and brought down the curtain on that act with the dropping of the final spoon. I thought now that he would go back to his work in the kitchen, but it looked as if he had something else to do first. He straightened himself, thrust his chin in the air, and put his head back, reminding me very forcibly of a young cockerel preparing to crow, and roared with the full force of his lungs, "'Turn out, boys, and look sharp!' Now he had finished his morning duty there. 
the sleeping bags seemed suddenly to awake to life, and such remarks as, "'That's a devil of a fellow,' or "'Shut up, you old chatterbox,' showed that the inhabitants of Framheim were now awake. Beaming with joy, the cause of the trouble disappeared into the kitchen. And now, one after the other, they stick their heads out, followed by the rest of them. That must be Helmer Hansen, who was on the cure. He looks as if he could handle a rope. Ah, and there we have Olaf Olafsson Bjarland. I could have cried aloud for joy, my old friend from Holmenkollen. The great long-distance runner, you remember. And he managed the jump, too, fifty metres, I think, standing. If Amundsen has a few like him, he will get to the pole all right. And there comes Stuberud, the man the Aftenpost said was so clever at double-entry bookkeeping. As I see him now, he does not give me the impression of being a bookkeeper, but one can't tell. And here come Hassel, Johansen, and Prestrud. Now they are all up, and will soon begin the day's work. Stuberud! It is Lindstrom, putting his head in at the door. If you want any hot cakes, you must get some air down. Stubberud merely smiles. He looks as if he felt sure of getting them all the same. What was it he talked about? Hot cakes? They must be connected with the beautiful dough and the delicate, seductive smell of cooking that is now penetrating through the crack of the door. Stubberud is going, and I must go with him. Yes, as I thought. There stands Lindstrom in all his glory before the range, brandishing the weapon with which he turns the cakes, and in a pan lie three brownish-yellow buckwheat cakes, quivering with the heat of the fire. Heavens, how hungry it made me! I take up my old position so as not to be in anyone's way, and watch Lindstrom. He's the man. He produces hot cakes with astonishing dexterity. It almost reminds one of a juggler throwing up balls so rapid and regular is the process. The way he manipulates a cake slice shows a fabulous proficiency. With the skimmer in one hand, he dumps fresh dough into the pan, and with the cake slice in the other, he removes those that are done, all at the same time. It seems almost more than human. There comes Visting, salutes, and holds out a little tin mug. Flattered by the honour, the cook fills his mug with boiling water, and he disappears into the penthouse. But this interruption puts Lindstrom off his jugglery with the hot cakes. One of them rolls down onto the floor. This fellow is extraordinarily phlegmatic. I can't make out whether he missed that cake or not. I believe the sigh that escaped him at the same instant meant something like, Well, we must leave some for the dogs. And now they all come in single file with their little mugs, and get each a drop of boiling water. I get up, interested in this proceeding, and slip out with one of them into the penthouse, and so on to the barrier. You will hardly believe me when I tell you what I saw— all the polar explorers standing in a row, brushing their teeth. What do you say to that? So, they are not such absolute pigs after all. There was a scent of stomatol everywhere. Here comes Amundsen. He has evidently been taking the meteorological observations, as he holds the anemometer in one hand. I follow him through the passage, and, when no one is looking, take the opportunity of slapping him on the shoulder and saying, "'A grand lot of boys!' He only smiled, but a smile may often say more than many words. I understood what it meant. He had known that a long while, and a good deal more. End of section 16。section 17 of the South Pole。this is a LibriVox recording。all LibriVox recordings are in the public domain。for more information or to volunteer。Please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Philippa Jevons. The South Pole by Roald Amundsen. Translation by A. G. Carter. Section 17. Volume 1. Chapter 8. A Day at Framheim. Part 2. It was now eight o'clock. The door from the kitchen to the room was left wide open, and the warmth streamed in and mixed with the fresh air that Stubberud had now forced to come down the right way. Now it was pleasanter inside, fresh, warm air everywhere. Then came a very interesting scene. As the toothbrushing gentlemen returned, they had to guess the temperature, one by one. This gave occasion for much joking and fun, and amid laughter and chat the first meal of the day was taken. In after-dinner speeches, amid toasts and enthusiasm, 
our polar explorers are often compared with our forefathers, the bold Vikings. This comparison never occurred to me for a moment when I saw this assemblage of ordinary, everyday men brushing their teeth. But now that they were busy with the dishes, I was bound to acknowledge its aptitude, for our forefathers the Vikings could not possibly have attacked their food with greater energy than these nine men did. One pile of hot chick after another disappeared as if they had been made of air, and I, in my simplicity, had imagined that one of them was a man's ration. Spread with butter and surmounted with jam, these cakes slipped down with fabulous rapidity. With a smile I thought of the conjurer, holding an egg in his hand one minute and making it disappear the next. If it is a cook's best reward to see his food appreciated, then indeed Lindstrom had good wages. The cakes were washed down with big bowls of strong, aromatic coffee. One could soon trace the effect, and conversation became general. The first great subject was a novel, which was obviously very popular, and which was called The Rome Express. It appeared to me, from what was said, I have unfortunately never read this celebrated work, that a murder had been committed in this train, and a lively discussion arose as to who had committed it. I believe the general verdict was one of suicide. I have always supposed that subjects of conversation must be very difficult to find on expeditions like these, where the same people mix day after day for years, but there was certainly no sign of any such difficulty here. No sooner had the express vanished in the distance than in steamed the language question, and it came at full steam too. It was clear that there were adherents of both camps present. For fear of hurting the feelings of either party I shall abstain from setting down what I heard, but I may say as much as this, that the party of reform ended by declaring the Marl to be the only proper speech of Norway, while their opponents maintained the same of their language. After a while pipes came out, and the scent of plug soon struggled with the fresh air for supremacy. Over the tobacco the work for the day was discussed. "'Well, I'll have enough to do supplying that wood-swallower over the holiday,' said Hassel. I gave a chuckle. If Hassel had known of the way the paraffin was used that morning, he would have added something about the oil-drinker, I expect. It was now half-past eight, and Stubberud and Bjarland got up. From the number of different garments they took out and put on, I guessed they were going out. Without saying anything, they trudged out. Meanwhile the others continued their morning smoke, and some even began to read, but by about nine they were all on the move. They put on their skin clothing, and made ready to go out. By this time Bjarland and Stipperud had returned from a walk, as I understood from such remarks as, "'Beastly cold!' and "'Sharp snow by the depot!' and the like." Prestrud was the only one who did not get ready to go out. He went to an open space underneath the farthest bunk, where there was a box. He raised the lid of this, and three chronometers appeared. At the same moment, three of the men produced their watches, and a comparison was made and entered in a book. After each watch had been compared, its owner went outside, taking his watch with him. I took the opportunity of slipping out with the last man. Prestrud and his chronometers were too serious for me. I wanted to see what the others were about. There was plenty of life outside. Dogs' howls in every key came from the tents. Some of those who had left the house before us were out of sight, so they had probably gone to their respective tents, and presently one could see by the lights that they were in the act of letting their dogs loose. How well the lighted-up tents looked against the dark, star-strewn sky! Though it could no longer be called dark, the little flush of dawn had spread and overpowered the glow of the aurora australis, which had greatly decreased since I last saw it. Evidently it was near its end. Now the four-footed band began to swarm out, darting like rockets from the tents. Here were all colours, grey, black, red, brown, white, and a mixture of all of them. What surprised me was that they were all so small, but otherwise they looked splendid, plump and round, well-kept and groomed, bursting with life. They instantly collected into little groups of from two to five, and it was easy to see that these groups consisted of intimate friends. They absolutely petted each other. In each of these clusters there was one in particular who was made much of. All the others came round him, licked him, fawned upon him, and gave him every sign of deference. They all run about without a sign of unfriendliness. Their chief interest seems to be centred in two large black mounds that are visible in the foreground of the camp. 
What they are I am unable to make out. There is not enough light for that, but I am probably not far wrong in guessing that they are seals. They are rather hard eating, anyhow, for I can hear them crunching under the dog's teeth. Here there is an occasional disturbance of the peace. They do not seem to agree so well over their food, but there is never a regular battle. A watchman is present, armed with a stick, and when he shows himself and makes his voice heard, they soon separate. They appear to be well disciplined. What appealed to me most was the youngsters, and the youngest of all. The young ones, to judge from their appearance, were about ten months old. They were perfect in every way. One could see that they had been well cared for from their birth. Their coats were surprisingly thick, much more so than those of the older dogs. They were remarkably plucky and would not give in to anyone. And there are the smallest of all. Like little balls of wool, they roll themselves in the snow and have great fun. I am astonished that they can stand the cold as they do. I should never have thought that such young animals could live through the winter. Afterwards I was told that they not only bore the cold well, but were far more hardy than the older ones. While the grown-up dogs were glad to go into their tents in the evening, the little ones refused to do so. They preferred to sleep outside. And they did so for a great part of the winter. Now all the men have finished unchaining their dogs, and with their lanterns in their hands they move in various directions and disappear, apparently into the barrier surface. There will be many interesting things to see here in the course of the day, I can understand that. What on earth became of all these people? There we have Amundsen. He is left alone and appears to be in charge of the dogs. I go up to him and make myself known. Ah, I'm glad you came, he says. Now I can introduce you to some of our celebrities. To begin with, here is the trio, Fix, Lasser and Snipperson. They always behave like this when I am out. Could not think of leaving me in peace for an instant. Fix, that big grey one that looks like a wolf, has many a snap on his conscience. His first exploit was on Fleckero, near Christiansand, where all the dogs were kept for a month after they arrived from Greenland. There he gave Lindstrom a nasty bite when his back was turned. What do you think of a bite of a mouth like that? Fix is now tame, and without a growl allows his master to take hold of his upper and under jaws and open his mouth. Ye gods, what teeth! I inwardly rejoice that I was not in Lindstrom's trousers that day. If you notice, he continues with a smile, you will see that Lindstrom still sits down cautiously. I myself have a mark on my left calf, and a good many more of us have the same. There are several of us who still treat him with respect. And here we have Lasserson. That's his pet name. He was christened Lasser. Almost pure black, as you see. I believe he was the wildest of the lot when they came on board. I had him fastened up on the bridge with my other dogs, beside Fix. Those two were friends from their Greenland days. But I can tell you that when I had to pass Lasser, I always judged the distance first. As a rule, he just stood looking down at the deck, exactly like a mad bull. If I tried to make overtures, he didn't move, stood quite still, but I could see how he drew back his upper lips and showed a row of teeth with which I had no desire to become acquainted. A fortnight passed in this way. Then at last the upper lip sank and the head was raised a little, as though he wanted to see who it was that brought him food and water every day. But the way from that to friendship was long and tortuous. In the time that followed I used to scratch him on the back with a stick. At first he jumped round, seized the stick and crushed it between his teeth. I thought myself lucky that it was not my hand. I came a little nearer to him every day until one day I risked my hand. He gave me an ugly look but did nothing. And then came the beginning of our friendship. Day by day we became better friends, and now you can see what footing we are on. The third is Snipperson, a dark red lady. She is their sworn friend and never leaves them. She is the quickest and most active of our dogs. You can see that she is fond of me. She is generally on her hind legs and makes every effort to get at my face. I have tried to get her out of the way of that, but in vain. She will have her own way. I have no other animals for the moment that are worth showing, unless you would care to hear a song. If so, there is Uranus, who is a professional singer. We'll take the trio with us, and you shall hear. We made for two black and white dogs that were lying by themselves on the snow a little way off, while the three jumped and danced about us. As we approached the other two, and they caught sight of the trio, they both jumped up as though at a word of command, and I guessed that we had found the singer. Lord, save us! What an 
awful voice. I could see that the concert was for Lasser's benefit, and Uranus kept it up as long as we stood in his vicinity. But then my attention was suddenly aroused by the appearance of another trio, which made an extraordinary favourable impression. I turned to my companion for information. Yes, he continued, those are three of Hansen's team, probably some of our best animals. The big black and white one is called Zanko. He appears to be rather old. The two others, which look like sausages with matches underneath, are Ring and Mylius. As you see, they're not very big, rather on the small side, but they are undoubtedly among our best workers. From their looks we have concluded that they're brothers. They're as alike as two drops of water. Now we will go straight through the mass and see whether we come across any more celebrities. There we have Carenius, Sauen, Schwartz and Lucy. They belong to Stuberud and are a power in the camp. Bjarland's tent is close by. His favourites are lying there. Kvine, Lap, Pan, Gorky and Yala. They're small, all of them, but fine dogs. There, in the southeast corner, stands Hassel's tent, but we shall not see any of his dogs here now. They're all lying outside the entrance to the oil store where he's generally to be found. The next tent is Visting's. We must take a turn round there and see if we can find his lot. Ah, there they are, those four playing there. The big reddish-brown one on the right is the Colonel, our handsomest animal. His three companions are Sugen, Ardner and Brun. I must tell you a little story about the Colonel when he was on Fleckero. He was perfectly wild then, and he broke loose and jumped into the sea. He wasn't discovered till he was halfway between Fleckero and the mainland, where he was probably going in search of a joint of mutton. Visting and Lindstrom, who were then in charge of the dogs, put off in a boat, and finally succeeded in overtaking him, but they had a hard tussle before they managed to get him on board. Afterwards, Visting had a swimming race with the colonel, but I don't remember what was the result. We can expect a great deal of these dogs. There's Johansson's tent over in the corner. There's not much to be said about his dogs. The most remarkable of them is Camilla. She is an excellent mother and brings up her children very well. She usually has a whole army of them, too. Now, I expect you have seen dogs enough. So, if you have no objection, I will show you underground Framheim and what goes on there. I may just as well add that we are proud of this work, and you will probably find that we have a right to be. We'll begin with Hassel, as his department is nearest. We now went in the direction of the house, passed its western end, and soon arrived at an erection that looked like a derrick. Underneath it was a large trap-door. Where the three legs of the derrick met, there was made fast a small block, and through the block ran a rope made fast at one end to the trap-door. A weight hung at the other end, some feet above the surface of the snow. "'Now we are at Hassel's,' said my companion. It was a good thing he could not see me, for I must have looked rather foolish. "'At Hassel's,' I said to myself. "'What in the world does the man mean? We were standing on the bare barrier. "'Do you hear that noise? That's Hassel's sawing wood.' Now he bent down and raised the heavy trap-door easily with the help of the weight. Broad steps of snow led down, deep down, into the barrier. We left the trap-door open so as to have the benefit of the little daylight there was, my host went first, I followed. After descending four or five steps, we came to a doorway which was covered with a woollen curtain. We pushed this aside. The sound that had first reached me as a low rumbling now became sharper, and I could plainly hear that it was caused by sawing. We went in. The room we entered was long and narrow, cut out of the barrier. On a solid shelf of snow there lay barrel after barrel, arranged in exemplary order, if they were all full of paraffin, I began to understand Lindstrom's extravagance in lighting his fire in the morning. Here was paraffin enough for several years. In the middle of the room a lantern was hanging, an ordinary one with wire netting round the glass. In a dark room it certainly would not have given much light, but in these white surroundings it shone like the sun. A primus lamp was burning on the floor. The thermometer, which hung a little way from the primus, showed minus five degrees Fahrenheit, so Hassel could hardly complain of the heat, but he had to saw, so it did not matter. We approached Hassel. He looked as if he had plenty to do, and was sawing away so that the sawdust was flying. Morning. Morning. The sawdust flew faster and faster. You seem to be busy today. Oh, yes. The saw was now working with dangerous rapidity. 
If I'm to get finished for the holiday, I must hurry up. How's the coal supply getting on? That took effect. The saw stopped instantly, was raised and put down by the wall. I waited for the next step in suppressed excitement. Something hitherto undreamt of must be going to happen. Hassel looked round. One can never be careful enough. Approached my host and whispered with every sign of caution, I did him out of twenty-five kilos last week. I breathed again. I had expected something much worse than that. With a smile of satisfaction, Hassel resumed his interrupted work, and I believe nothing in the world would have stopped him again. The last I saw as we returned through the doorway was Hassel surrounded by a halo of sawdust. We were back on the barrier surface. A touch of the finger and the trap door swung over and fell noiselessly into its place. I could see that Hassel was capable of other things besides sawing birchwood. Outside lay his team, guarding all his movements, Mikkel, Riven, Masmus, and Elsa. They all looked well. Now we were going to see the others. We went over to the entrance of the hut and raised the trap door. A dazzling light met my eyes. In the wall of the steps leading down from the surface, a recess had been cut to hold a wooden case lined with bright tin. This contained a little lamp which produced this powerful light. But it was the surroundings that made it so bright, ice and snow everywhere. Now I could look about me for the first time. It had been dark when I came in the morning. There was the snow tunnel leading to the penthouse. I could see that by the threshold that grinned at me. But there, in the opposite direction, what was there? I could see that the passage was continued, but where did it lead? Standing in the bright light, it looked quite dark in the tunnel. Now we will go and see Bjarland first. With these words, my companion bent down and set off through the dark passage. Look there, in the snow wall, just under our feet. Can you see the light? By degrees, my eyes had accustomed themselves to the darkness of the tunnel, and I could see a greenish light shining through the snow wall where he pointed. And now another noise fell on my ears, a monotonous sound coming from below. Look out for the steps. Yes, he could be sure of that. I had come one cropper that day, and it was enough. We once more descended into the barrier, by broad, solid snow steps covered with boards. Suddenly a door was opened, a sliding door in the snow wall, and I stood in Bjarland's and Stibber's premises. The place might be about six feet high, fifteen feet long, and seven feet wide. On the floor lay masses of shavings which made it warm and cosy. At one end stood a primus lamp, with a large tin case over it, from which steam was issuing. "'How's it going?' "'All right. We're just bending the runners. I've made a rough estimate of the weight, and find I can bring it down to forty-eight pounds.' This seemed to me almost incredible. Amundsen had told me on the way up this morning of the heavy sledges they had, a hundred and sixty-five pounds each, and now Bjarland was going to bring them down to forty-eight pounds, less than a third of their original weight. In the snow walls of the room were fixed hooks and shelves where the tools were kept. Bjarland's carpenter's bench was massive enough, cut out in the snow and covered with boards. Along the opposite wall was another planing bench, equally massive, but somewhat shorter than the first. This was evidently Stubberid's place. He was not here today, but I could see that he was engaged in planing down the sledge cases and making them lighter. One of them was finished. I leaned forward and looked at it. On the top, where a little round aluminium lid was let in, was written, Original weight, nine kilos. Reduced weight, six kilos. I could understand what this saving of weight meant to men who were going on such a journey as these had before them. One lamp provided all the illumination, but it gave an excellent light. We left Bjarland. I felt sure that the sledging outfit was in the best of hands. We then made our way into the penthouse, and here we met Stibberud. He was engaged in cleaning up and putting things straight for the holiday. All the steam that came out of the kitchen, when the door was opened, had condensed on the roof and walls in the form of rime several inches thick, and Stubberud was now clearing this off with a long broom. Everything was going to be shipshape for midwinter eve. I could see that. We went in. Dinner was on, humming and boiling. The kitchen floor was scrubbed clean, and the linoleum with which it was covered shone gaily. It was the same in the living room. Everything was cleaned. The linoleum on the floor and the American cloth on the table were equally bright. 
The air was pure, absolutely pure. All the bunks were made tidy, and the stools put in their places. There was no one here. You have only seen a fraction of our underground palaces, but I thought we would take a turn in the loft first and see what it's like. Follow me. We went out into the kitchen, and then up some steps fastened in the wall, and through the trap-door to the loft. With the help of a little electric lamp we were able to look about us. The first thing that met my eyes was the library. There stood the Framheim library, and it made the same good impression as everything else. Books numbered from one to eighty in three shelves. The catalogue lay by the side of them, and I cast my eye over it. Here were books to suit all tastes. Librarian Adolf Henrik Lindström, I read at the end. So he was librarian too. Truly a many-sided man. Long rows of cases stood here, full of whortleberry jam, cranberries, syrup, cream, sugar, and pickles. In one corner I saw every sign of a dark room. A curtain was hung up to keep the light off, and there was an array of developing dishes, measuring glasses, etc. This loft was made good use of. We had now seen everything, and descended again to continue our inspection. Just as we reached the penthouse, Lindstrom came in with a big bucket of ice. I understood that it was to be used in the manufacture of water. My companion had armed herself with a large and powerful lantern, and I saw that we were going to begin our underground travels. In the north wall of the penthouse there was a door, and through this we went, entering a passage built against the house, and dark as the grave. The lantern had lost its power of illumination. It burned with a dull, dead light which did not seem to penetrate beyond the glass. I stretched my hands in front of me. My host stopped, and gave me a lecture on the wonderful order and tidiness they had succeeded in establishing among them. I was a willing listener, for I had already seen enough to be able to certify the truth of what he told me without hesitation. But in the place we were now in, I had to take his word for it, for it was all as black as bilge water. We had just started to move on again, and I felt so secure, after all he had told me about the orderly way things were kept, that I let go my guide's anorak, which I had been holding. But that was foolish of me. Smack! I went down at full length. I had trodden on something round, something that brought me down. As I fell I caught hold of something, also round, and I lay convulsively clutching it. I wanted to convince myself of what it was that lay about on the floor of such a tidy house. The glimmer of the lantern, though not particularly strong, was enough to show me what I held in my arms. A Dutch cheese. I put it back in the same place, for the sake of tidiness, sat up, and looked down at my feet. What was it I had stumbled over? A Dutch cheese, if it wasn't another of the same family. I began to form my own opinion of the tidiness now, but said nothing. But I should like to know why he didn't fall over the cheeses as he was walking in front. Oh, I answered myself, I guess he knew what sort of order the place was in. End of section 17